Let's take a look briefly at the kinematics for a parallel manipulator. Just like we did with serial manipulators, with parallel manipulators we have both forward and inverse kinematics. However, one of the differences here is that with serial manipulators, the forward kinematics was easy and the inverse kinematics was much more difficult. With parallel manipulators, it's the other way around. The forward kinematics is the part of the problem that's difficult. And the inverse kinematics part is much easier. This means that if we know the kinds of motions we want the end effector of our parallel manipulator to have, then it's easy for us to find either the joint angles or the joint displacements that produce that kind of a motion for our manipulator. I'm going to illustrate that for you now by going through the inverse kinematics for the Stewart platform. I'm going to start by showing you how the inverse kinematics for the Stewart platform is derived in two dimensions with a two degree of freedom manipulator. Then we'll expand the case to the three dimensional case with a six degree of freedom manipulator. To show how the inverse kinematics is derived for the Stewart platform, I'm first going to draw a base frame. And this will be a two dimensional base frame, which we'll start off with. So I'll draw an X and Y axis. Next, I'm going to draw my Stewart platform. With the Stewart platform, the two prismatic joints are both attached to ground. Both of these joints are attached to ground with a revolute joint that is not actuated. So I'm going to draw that here with a uh, picture of a two-dimensional joint. So this is what I've drawn here is like two hinges. Connected to these two hinges is uh, two prismatic joints. They're two-dimensional prismatic joints, and that's why I drew them as squares rather than the little cubes like we usually see in three dimensions. At the top, these two joints are attached to two additional uh, revolute joints, which are both attached to a platform. Here I've made it a bit bigger so it'll be easier to see. On the platform, I'm going to draw a second frame of reference. This will be called the one frame. In the inverse kinematics problem, we're going to specify a position and rotation or orientation for the end effector, that is for frame one. And we want to find out the joint variables, in this case, the lengths of these two joints to get that position and orientation that we've specified. This problem turns out to be much easier to solve if we try to solve it as a vector addition problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start drawing in some vectors into this picture. The first vectors I'm going to draw are some vectors from frame zero to the base location of the two joints. And I'm going to call these two vectors, vector A1 and vector A2. I'm calling it this so that we can synchronize our notation with the way that this is specified in robotics textbooks. Next, I'm going to draw some vectors from the base of the joint up to the place where the joint is attached to the platform. And I'm going to label these vectors to be S1 and S2. Both A1, A2, and S1, S2 are expressed in the base frame. Now 
Now note that if we were able to find the vectors S1 and S2, we will have solved our inverse kinematics problem because the inverse kinematics problem is where we're trying to find the joint variables. In this case, the two joint variables are the, uh, the prismatic joint extension of joints 1 and 2. If we know these vectors S1 and S2, we can simply take their magnitude or length and that will tell us how long each of these joints should be. There are a few more things in this diagram that we know and that I can draw in. One thing that we know is the vector from the center of frame 0 all the way up to the center of frame 1. I'm going to label this vector as vector P. Vector P is the position that we want this frame or this platform to have. That's part of the input of our inverse kinematics problem. So we know what vector P is. So far, we know vectors A1 and A2 because they're part of our robot design. We know vector P because that's part of the input of the inverse kinematics problem. And we're trying to find vectors S1 and S2. There's one more important thing in this picture that we know. We know the location of the attachment of both of these joints relative to the center of the frame this vector right here and right here, which is a little bit small and difficult to see in this picture. I'm going to call these two vectors B1 and this one over here B2. B1 and B2 are part of our robot design. These two vectors state where on the platform we've attached the joints. These two vectors, we have to note, this is very important, are not expressed in the base frame. They're expressed in frame 1. In other words, we take this platform and we attach the two joints to that platform. We know where, relative to the center of the platform, we've attached the joints but we don't necessarily know where those joint attachments are relative to the ground. So now we have in our picture all of the variables that we know and all of the variables that we're trying to find. We want to solve for S1 and S2 using the other variables that we have in the picture. And we can do this by adding vectors together. If you look carefully at this picture, you will see that from, if we start from the center of frame 0 and we travel along vector A2 and then travel along vector S2, we will arrive at this joint. We'll also arrive at that joint if we start at the center of frame 1, travel along vector P up to the center of frame 1, and then travel along vector B2. We'll also arrive at the same joint. What that tells us is that if we add the vectors A2 and S2, that should be equal to vector P plus vector B2. However, there is one important thing that we need to take care of before this equation will be true and that is that vector B2 is expressed in frame 1 while all of the other vectors that we've written here are expressed in the base frame in frame 0. If you remember back to our initial things we learned about uh, expressing vectors in different frames, then you know what we could do to vector B2 in order to express it in frame 0. All we have to do is take vector B2 and multiply it by the rotation frame. That is the rotation frame that goes from frame 0 to frame 1. If we multiply that rotation matrix times B2, 
expressed in frame 1. That will give us vector B2 expressed in frame 0. And so our final inverse kinematics equation looks like this. S2, that's the vector that we're trying to find, is equal to P, the desired position of the platform, plus the rotation of the platform times vector B2 minus vector A2. In this equation, P and R are the input. That's the position and the rotation that we want for the frame, or for the platform. B2 and A2 are parameters that we set in building this robot. And that gives us the output S2 which tells us the lengths that we should set for, uh, leg, S2, for leg 2 in order to achieve the, the desired position and rotation of the platform. As it turns out, we can simply generalize this equation to more degrees of freedom and to additional dimensions into 3D space. The generalized equation simply substitutes the letter i to represent each leg of the robot. So what we get as the final inverse kinematics equation looks like this. The vector s, which defines leg i, is equal to the position vector of the center of the platform plus the rotation matrix which we set for the platform times the vector B for leg I, that is the vector between the center of the platform and the position where the leg is attached to the platform for leg I, minus vector AI. Vector AI is the vector between the center of the base frame and the position where the uh, leg joint is attached to the ground. The forward kinematics problem, as I mentioned before, is more difficult than this. In fact, the forward kinematics problem generally has to be done through simulation. In class, we're going to see how to uh, write these equations into MATLAB and do a simulation to design and animate a Stuart platform.